gratitude is a very beautiful thing and a big part of the Jewish experience. So when a person would go to the Beis HaMikdash and bring the dedication of new fruits, Bikurim, or the various maestros that they would bring, the various tithes, they would give gratitude to Hashem for all of the blessings that they had. And then the Torah says, V'shamarta some that you will guard and do these things. Rashi says that's actually not an instruction. It's actually a blessing. Tishne l'shana haba, you'll have the opportunity again next year. And he highlights that point, that you'll have the blessing of being able to repeat these donations again next year. What's interesting about it is, why is Rashi putting it into the context specifically of Bikurim? Because if you read the order, first the Torah tells us about Bikurim first fruits, then it tells us about the Maestros, and then it says this promise. So why does Rashi link it specifically to Bikurim and not to Maeser? He also says that there'll be a heavenly voice that gives you this brocha. Where does he get that from? So it is strange because it's not usual for a Pasuk to refer to something which was spoken about a few psukim ago rather than refer to what's immediately beforehand, which in this case is the Maeser. So the only logical reason that you would immediately think of is Maeser should not be delayed, right? Tishne the Shana Haba, Maeser is sometimes given on a non-annual basis and it wouldn't make sense that you give somebody a brocha and say, but the brocha is not going to happen still for a couple of years. Um, we're also going to see that there's a link between the wording in the Pasuk right at the end, just before this brocha, and the concept of Bikurim, and that's actually the, the, the link that Rashi is learning and looking for. He's going to tell us that this is a scenario of Mida Keneged Mida, where Hashem gives us certain brochas, and therefore we contribute, and because of our contribution, Hashem gives us brochas in kind as well. What's beautiful about the Sikha is we're going to link Rashi's interpretation with the Alter Rebbe's interpretation according to Chassidus, and that gives us an insight into Rosh Hashanah and our dedication to Hashem soul-wise, which is similar to the dedication of Bikurim, and how we are almost guaranteed that we will have that dedication to Hashem, and therefore we'll get all the great brochas from Hashem in response. In our parasha, after tells us the laws of Bikurim and of the confession, the so-called announcement, the declaration that you have to make after you bring the various tithes, it says, Hayoim Hazeh, this day, now Hayoim Hazeh is going to be a relevant in, uh, uh, term because, you know, it, it always implies a day that we know. Hashem instructs you to follow all of these laws. And then it says, You will guard them and you will do them with all your heart and with all your soul. Commenting on that, when the Torah says that you will guard and do these things, the second Rashi that comments on this particular verse, uh, this phrase says as follows, there's a heavenly voice that that blesses the individual and says, You brought Bikurim to the Beis HaMikdash today. You are blessed to be able to repeat this opportunity again next year, which implies obviously that you'll have a great yield out of your crops and you'll be bringing Bikurim again. So the first thing that strikes you is when you read the Pasuk, you probably imagined that he was saying you should guard and keep the Torah and instead here he's telling us that it's a promise you will. Why, in fact, does Rashi explain that does not mean you shall God and you shall do. Rather, it's a brocha and an assurance from Hashem that you will have the opportunity to do this mitzvah again. Which is strange. Rashi seems to digress from the simple explanation of the words, which sound like an instruction. In fact, many of them read it as an instruction. You shall keep the Torah. Why does Rashi do differently? Why does Rashi say that it's an assurance? It's actually fairly straightforward and various of the commentators in Rashi point this out. It's all about context. Just look at the flow, look at the context. We're already after the part where the Torah gave the instructions how and when to bring Bikurim, how and when to do the Maestros and make the, the declaration. Not only has the Torah told me how to do it, we're already after the part where the Torah says, and you've done it. As Rashi commented on the Pasuk, where part of our declaration is Hashem look down from your heavenly abode and bless us, says Rashi, what are we actually saying? We've already done what you asked. So the Torah is past the section of the instruction and past the section of the execution. We've done the instruction. 
ואף הפסוקים הבואים לאחרי ושמעת ואוסיסם, אינם מדברים עוד על דבר הציוויים. And the next פסוקים that are about to follow are no longer talking about instruction, אלא עוד השפחם של ישראל. These are פסוקים that praise the Jewish people. אז השם המרת גוימר והשם המירכו גוימר, that you dedicated and selected השם as your God, and השם selected you as his people. So, we're past, long past, the instructions, therefore, according to Pshat, Harishayn, Mokim, Kala, Foresh, Sheva, Shamarit, Ve'osisa, Hutzivoy. It doesn't make any sense, then, to say that these words, you should guard and you should keep, are, in fact, an instruction, because the instructions would have been with the other instructions a few psukim earlier. Dim Kain, Ein, Lepos, Exekol, Hemshach, Ve'kishar, because if you do believe that Ve'shamarit, Ve'osisa, is an instruction, then the connection doesn't work. This Veshomart Veosisa is not linked in any logical way to the Pesukim immediately before, because those are telling the story of what's happened, you've brought your Bikurim, etc. And it wouldn't link to the Pesukim that follow, because those are praising the Jewish people. Therefore, Rashi says, the simplest way to explain this is, you've given us the instructions, we have followed the instructions, now we're going to receive a bracha from Hashem to have the opportunity to follow these instructions again next year. If you take that approach, then yesh le pasuk zeh. Then this pasuk does have ki bracha schar hakimitzis bikurim by virtue of the fact that this pasuk is describing a reward, a response from Hashem for us doing bikurim. Shaykh is the pasukim shalachra. It links it to the pasukim that are about to follow, which are all about the fisha gamhem oiskim b'shiv cham sheisol, all about the greatness of the Jewish people. Shem neisol zoychem la v'ashem emir chov goimer tischar alas es Hashem hemar to goimer because the next pasuk is also talking about response from Hashem. I'm selecting you as my special nation. For the fact that you selected me as your God. So it flows beautifully. This will also help us to understand the language that Rashi chose to use, which doesn't link directly to the language in the Psukim. He uses the word Tishne. You should repeat this opportunity again next year. Really, you would have expected Rashi to say, you will bring Bikurim and Maestros again next year. Which would flow with his statement. His statement is, you have brought Bikurim today. You will bring Bikurim again next year. But he doesn't do that. He says, you will repeat. Or you would have expected Rashi to say, you will do this ritual again next year. Which would fit the language of the Pasuk. That you should do these mitzvahs. Why did he dafka choose the word tishne that you'll repeat? But now that we've contextualized that Rashi is helping us to understand that these words you will observe actually link to what's about to follow, praise of the Jewish people. That actually helps us to understand why Rashi specifically chooses the word Repeat. You will repeat this ritual next year. Why? Because what we are going to see is the flow of these psukim is that we're talking about things that are midah keneged midah. Hashem replies to us aligned with what we have done. So, Hashem responds with a measurement that is I will select you as my people, keneged mida, which corresponds to the measure that you as people took, hemarto, to select Hashem as your God. So, meachash Hashem emarto, hinegam aschar ba ba Yisrael, ifem Hashem emircha. In other words, because you behaved in a certain way, you selected Hashem as your only God, so too Hashem responds in kind and selects you as His only people. Especially when you consider, as Rashi is going to tell us, that these two expressions, Hemarta and Emircha, actually have no parallel anywhere else in Scripture. Then you have to say that Hashem's Hemircha is a mirror of your Hemarta, because these are words we don't find anywhere else, only in this context, that tells you that they mirror each other. So the theme of this section is that Hashem rewards you, Mida Keneged Mida. Therefore, Rashi says, well, then it's a no-brainer. That obviously, 
When the Torah says, you will again observe these rituals, which is obviously similar to the concept of this reciprocal relationship between us and Hashem. We choose Hashem, Hashem chooses us. And then a bracha alma. It's not just an ordinary, generic blessing for next year. Logic says it's got to be the kind of bracha where there is repetition because of what you have done. Therefore, you will have the opportunity to do it again. Next year, you will repeat the actions you're doing today. Which tells me that the reward is aligned with your behavior. So what does Rashi want us to know? Seeing as we're in a part of the conversation which is already talking about the praise of the Jewish people, it doesn't make sense that the Shomart of Yosisa should be an instruction. It actually makes sense it should be a reward. What kind of a reward? A reward that fits the context of what we're talking about. Mida keneged mida. That all makes sense. The only thing that doesn't seem to make sense is the technicality of, hang on a second, you spoke about Bikurim, then you spoke about Miser, and now Rashi, what's making you go back to Bikurim? Surely you should be talking now about Miser and saying, you brought Miser, you will have Brocha in the next year. So we need to understand why Rashi says, you have brought Bikurim. The parasha immediately before this, Speaking about the tithes. Yes, of course, the person who makes the declaration about Maiser, Vido Maiser, says, and I also gave the other tithes, which includes Bikurim, which is true. But the main thrust of what that's talking about is the declaration that a person makes over Maiser. Whereas Bikurim was already discussed two paragraphs ago. In the section that was before the section of Miser. Now that's not usually how Psukim flow. They don't jump back to a previous point. They flow. So why does Rashi say that the Vidoy Miser, to which you get the response from heaven, that you'll do this again next year. Why does he say it's talking about Bikurim? should be talking about Miser. Rashi seems to be taking us back two steps. Now we're getting the reward of something that we already discussed two paragraphs ago. Why is he not saying that this promise for next year links to the Maisa that you've just given, just discussed in the previous paragraph? Okay, so we do know that there are certain places in Torah where a Pasuk will refer both to what was immediately discussed and to something that was discussed earlier. Still, it's completely illogical to suggest that a Pasuk would only relate to something discussed earlier and have no connection to what was just discussed. That doesn't make sense. So why is Rashi assuming that this promise for next year speaks to Bikurim, which are a while back and not to that which is, so to speak, close by? You shouldn't think that Rashi was just giving an example. He used the example of Bikurim and really he means that all of these things will be repeated next year. So I use the example of Bikurim, but really the Brocha also extends to Maiser as well. Why not? Because that's not practical. Because when Rashi uses the expression that you will repeat this ritual next year, that would not fit with the declaration of a Maeser. You only make that declaration once every three years because there's a whole system of Maeser. And you don't bring the same Maeser every single year. So you only make the announcement once every three years. And Rashi is saying that the ritual that you're going to be blessed to repeat is going to happen next year. So that can't be Maeser. So therefore, it's pretty clear that Rashi is of the view that whatever is going to repeat next year as this great reward and bracha from Hashem for what you've done must relate to Bikurim because Bikurim can be again next year. Still, that's a, a great explanation, but it doesn't really tell us how the flow works. 
You just ended off talking about Miser. Why is Rashi talking about Bikurim? We haven't resolved that, even though logically it makes sense that Bikurim should be the thing that you do next year. Beyond that, let's ask a simple question. Any time throughout the entire Torah that the Torah tells us about the reward you receive for a mitzvah, Logically, throughout the whole Torah, when Hashem is going to announce a reward, He'll announce a clear reward linked to a clear mitzvah. There's no guessing games over here. Or Hashem will announce a reward that applies across all mitzvahs. Like in our parasha. So there you can see, it's like this generalized thing. You did X. So there you can see, it's like this generalized thing. You did X. You dedicated yourself to Hashem. Here's the reward for X, for your dedication. Hashem is equally dedicated to you. And then the Torah doesn't stop there. It actually spells it out in tremendous detail. As this parasha tells us, if you follow mitzvahs, you get all kinds of brachas. Whereas here, Rashi is doing something which is very unusual. To borrow an expression from Rashi, he's doing something here that you never see anywhere else. Suddenly, we hear out of nowhere, never seen a precedent for this, that when a Jewish person brings Bikurim, rather than a generalized announcement from Hashem that this mitzvah relates to that reward, Rashi is saying that when you do this mitzvah Bikurim, you get almost like a personalized divine SMS. You're going to be blessed to do this again next week, uh, next year. Now, whichever angle you look at this from, from a Kabbalistic angle, angle a, a Midrashic angle, angle an, an Alachic angle, where do you have any clue in the Pasuk that there's going to be a heavenly voice? And Rashi is not doing Midrash or Kabbalah, he's doing Pshat. Where in the Pshat do you see any indication that there was going to be this announcement from heaven to the person to say that, do this again next year. I, I guarantee it, I promise it. The answer is as follows. The answer is as follows. The immediately preceding paragraph spoke about when you finish the cycle of the maestros of the tithes, which happens every third year of the Shemitah cycle. Now, if we were to take Rashi's explanation, which means, Hashem promising, you will do this again. Tishne, you will do this again. And we now apply, applied this to Maeser. Koibe Maesers. That would give the impression that you will repeat this again. When? In three years' time, you'll repeat this. So I'm bringing Meiser now, and you're telling me the next time I'm going to repeat it is in three years. That sounds like I can delay the Meiser of the first and the second year until the third year. You can't say that. Sorry. First of all, the Torah says that you are going to fulfill all of these mitzvahs with your all, with your whole soul, your whole heart. Now, nobody delays something for a year or two if they're doing it with their whole heart and soul. That's number one. Number two. Plus, if you're telling me, my brocha to you is that you're going to delay the opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah for till the third year. That's not a brocha. So whichever angle you look at it from, Meiser does not fit well with Rashi's explanation. Therefore, Rashi has to say that brocha is about Bikurim. Because that's the thing that we know you're going to do again next year. So that's where the brocha has to be anchored to. 
then Tishne is, is really a brocha. We, we're telling you good news about yes, next year. That you are blessed that next year you will again bring Bikurim with all your heart and soul. It's just one problem. It's still not clear. So we get it. Rashi keeps going back to Bikurim because it fits better with the promise than Meiser does. But does it fit well with the words? How could you say now that this pasuk v'shamarta v'yosisa, which is the promise that you're going to be able to bring Bikurim again next year, is in no way linked to the immediately preceding pasuk? Because that was about Meiser and this is about Bikurim. Does it make sense to say that the great brocha and promise that Hashem gives you is only relevant to two paragraphs back? So the answer is, So the answer is yes. The context of the preceding section is primarily about Meiser and the declaration that you make of a Meiser, but... When you get right to the end of that section, the part that is immediately before our pasuk that we're analyzing, where Hashem blesses you for the next year, there, just before our conversation, is something in the declaration of Meiser that is specific to Bikurim. Which is the segue into our pasuk that talks about Hashem's brocha about Bikurim. What's there that speaks to Bikurim? The explanation is like this. So the whole parasha that talks about conclu- concluding the cycle of Meiser of tithes, it ends with a pasuk that you will be given a land that flows with milk and honey. What does it mean that it flows with milk and honey? Rashi already explained that to us a lot earlier. That it's milk that flows from the goats. And the honey flows from dates. Milk and honey are not things that you give miser from. Because meiser only belong, is, is only required from grains, from grapes, and from oil or from olives. Not dvash, not honey, not milk. Now the Pasuk just ended off talking about honey and milk. It can't be talking about meiser anymore. More than that. The truth is that Maiser belongs to all kinds of grain. Not only the grains that are mentioned in this particular Pasuk, the special uh, produce of Israel. So it's not limited only to uh, olives that have oil or dates that have honey. Meiser applies to other things too. But if you're going to talk about honey and and to an extent milk, but mainly honey, that's very relevant to Bikurim. Why? Because bringing Bikurim does apply to dates and the, the so-called honey that they produce. As Rashi already tells us in the beginning of the parasha. Besides the practicality of it that you can and do bring Bikurim from dates, the whole psychology of why you bring Bikurim is tied to the fact, because look what a beautiful land Hashem gave us. So those words, Zovas Cholavodvash, are words, it's a phrase that is linked to Bikurim because it's part of the motivation why we have Bikurim. Because the main issue of Bikurim is to show that we are not ungrateful for what Hashem has given us. As the Pasuk immediately continues, Look, now I have brought you the first of my produce. And Bikurim is the only thing you bring from these first fruits as opposed to Maiser. Maiser doesn't have to be the first produce. But Ochein, 
So therefore, it doesn't matter that the entire paragraph up until this point was about the declaration you make after bringing Meiser. And it doesn't even matter that these words about flowing with milk and honey are part of the declaration you make when you bring Meiser and you ask Hashem to please bless us. Why is that not a big deal? The fact that stands out for us is that the words flowing with milk and honey have a direct hyperlink to Bikurim. Because Bikurim is about the land of milk and honey. Thank you, Hashem, for that land. And Bikurim are from dates, which give this honey. Which then allows us the opportunity to explain that the Pasuk, albeit part of the conversation around Meiser, this particular Pasuk and this specific segment of the Pasuk, which is the very last thing we read before the Vashamart of Yossisa, that's talking about Bikurim. Okay, still not absolutely clear. It's still not 100% clear why. Okay, to explain what's not 100% clear, let's think for a second. The entire thrust of Bikurim is to highlight the fact that Hashem reciprocates to what we do. What we invest, Hashem gives us back in kind. And vice versa. What Hashem does for us, we respond in kind. So let's understand this because you're going to see that there's something missing in the picture here. First of all, what are we declaring? What's Bikurim all about? That Hashem, you took us out of a terrible place where we were slaves, a difficult land, and you took us into this beautiful place, flowing with milk and honey. So therefore, we have to reciprocate accordingly. Hashem took us to a beautiful place. So what we dedicate to Hashem shouldn't just be anything. It should be the best that we dedicate. The first of our fruits. And of the first fruits, which ones? The ones that are the richest, the ones that are the sweetest, like these dates. That's our response to Hashem. Mida keneged mida. And likewise, we should see the mida keneged mida response from Hashem towards us. Because we dedicated ourselves to be solely committed to Hashem, therefore Hashem responded to us. You're my only people. So if the entire dynamic of these psukim is mida keneged mida, something that Rashi says does not seem to have its clear mida keneged mida, or to put it more clearly, Something we do in the Pasuk doesn't seem to have its proper Midah Keneged Midah until Rashi actually alerts us to it. Let's ask. We get it. It's appropriate for me as a farmer in those days to go to this special place that Hashem had selected and present my Bikurim over there as gratitude. Hashem gave us a, a special place and a special land therefore we go to the special place within that land to present our Bikurim to show that we are not ungrateful and that the way we express our gratitude fits the theme of what Hashem did for us you gave us a special place I'll bring Bikurim from that special land to your special place but then the Torah says you don't stop there but you've got to add, he got to add, you have to make an announcement, a, a declaration. But yes, okay, what kind of a declaration? A loud declaration for all to hear. So Hashem should surely reciprocate for that too. I have announced my gratitude. Where is there an announcement from Hashem in response? If the mitzvah content includes an announcement, then Hashem should give Mida Kenegin Mida an announcement. So then logic and simple psha tells you that my announcement of gratitude must be met by an announcement from Hashem. 
what, what kind of announcement? How is that even possible? We know what happens when the when the Jews hear announcements from Hashem. It happened at Har Sinai. We couldn't handle it. And the Shabbos flew out of our bodies. And we said, please, Moshe, step in and be the intercessor. Who can handle announcements from heaven? Somebody of Moshe's caliber. Or a very high-powered Navi similar to Moshe who can receive Hashem's word and convey it. We can't hear that. Therefore, Rashi says, well, it then obviously had to be a baskol. A baskol is a heavenly voice that every person can potentially hear. And that's what it is, whether you hear it with your ears, whether it's a voice in your head, or whether it's just a sensation that you have. However, it works that the baskol speaks to you. But there has to be a response. And that's built into the Pshat of the Pasuk because everything is midah connected midah. If you're speaking to Hashem, Hashem's going to speak to you. That's all in the context of Rashi. We're going to see a beautiful link between how Rashi explains this Pasuk and constructs his explanation with the way that Hasidus in Likut Torah and this week's parsha, and also a little bit of Or HaTorah from the Tzemach Tzedek also speaks a very similar language in this parsha, but obviously at a more uh, spiritual level. One of the incredible things you'll see in Rashi. Rashi's whole explanation rests on the fact that what immediately preceded Hashem giving us this brocha for next year were the words Eretz of Aschol Vodvash. Matim Elibir Rabbein Azakan Al Pasuk, the Alter Rebbe makes the same comment in the Kutatayra. Mevur Bele Kutatayra. So in Lukut HaTorah, in this week's parasha, right at the beginning of this week's Lukut HaTorah, it says, The Al-Tarebbe makes the same link for different reasons. That the Hayom Azeh, the promise Hashem is giving you, just as you've brought Bikurim today, so you will be blessed next year, is directly linked to Eretz of Aschol Vodvash from the previous Pasuk. Therefore the al says, look at it. Udavash, which is the last letter, the last word of the previous pasuk, and then the first three words, Hayoim Hazeh Havaya, take the first letters of each of them, and you get a Vav, two Hayes, and a Yud, which is one Sirof, one combination of the letters of Hashem's name. So it's two different psukim, but it's one combination. That tells you that there is a very deep intrinsic response, a, very, a connection, I mean, between the two psukim. As the Alter Rebbe explains, because Vav of the word Udavash, even though it's at the beginning of the word Devash, actually forms the conjunction between the one Pasuk and the next. Beautiful, right? Both Rashi and the Alter Rebbe use the fact that there's a linkage between the two Psukim to create their explanation of what the Psukim means. Now, just as we see in Pshat, according to Rashi, that the word Hayoim is linked not only to the singular word Dvash, but the entire phrase, but in order to create that bridge, the key word that links the two is the word Dvash, because as we saw, Dvash is the one, the one word over there that relates specifically to Bikurim. Because as we've already discussed, the responsibility, the requirement to bring Bikurim would apply to dates, would not apply to milk. We're going to see the same methodology, the same structure of the cont- of the explanation in Chassidus. says, the al says the same thing, that the Pasuk Hayoim Hazeh, which is the promise of next year's Bikurim, is linked not just to the word Devash, which is part of the Rosh Tevis of that particular um, mashup of Hashem's name, but he specifically says it's related to the four words, Eretz Zovas Cholov Advash. which means that the connection between the two Psukim affects all of the four words in that phrase. And nevertheless, exactly like in the Pshat of Rashi, the bridge is that word, Udvash. So it's that 
Udvas, the Vav of the Dvash, that actually helps us make the Yudke Vavke in its particular format. So it's beautiful. We see that there's this correlation between Rashi and Chassidus, that they both see these Psukim as being linked to each other. They both see the message flowing right across the Psukim because of the word Dvash and a little bit more because of Eretz of Aschalov Dvash. Now we're going to make this very relevant because of the time of the year that we're in. With Al Tarebbe says, Hayoimaze, even though the Pasuk might be speaking very openly, Hayoimaze, kind of every single day that you do this mitzvah, Hashem promises you for next year, the Al Tarebbe says, Hayoimaze also refers specifically to Rosh Hashanah. Vinyag Vegam Yazem Matim in Pirashashi, Shah Pasuk Madabo Yedas Bikurim. And that even fits with Rashi, who says that this pasuk is talking about bikurim. Because there's a similarity between bikurim and Rosh Hashanah in that heim inyan shal reishis. Both of them are the beginning of a process, the beginning of the produce ripening, the beginning of a year. Yeserim izoi beyond that. Now, this is where it gets really fascinating because one of the distinctions between Bikurim and Truma is because Truma is also called Reishis Tvoscha, right? The first of your produce you give to the Kohen. So it's also called the first. And nevertheless, when it comes in practice, the time to disperse these various gifts to the Kohanim, Bikurim goes first, and then Truma, as Rashi himself already explained. The Tzemach Tzedek has a magnificent explanation in Oratari on this parasha, why that is. Why Bikurim is a step ahead of Truma. What does he say? Shaharish is the Truma Zein in when we refer to Truma as being the first of the gifts to the Koyen, Truma represents Torah. That Hashem acquired me, so to speak, as the first element of his path. So Reishis refers to Torah, and Truma is the representation of Torah. And then the, the Tzemach Tzedek says, and the Reishis, the first element associated with Bikurim is representative of the Jewish people who even come before the Torah. So in the same way as the Jewish people precede the Torah, as we know very well, Torah is designed for the Jews, so that implies that they have to already be Jews. Likewise, in practice, Bikurim come before Truma because Bikurim represents Yidin and Truma represents Torah. Or the Tzemach Tzedek then goes into a tremendous amount of detail explaining the following. That when we talk about Bikurim, we're actually describing the dimension of the Jewish soul at its essence, where it is one with Hashem's essence. It's at that level that the concept of Jewish people precedes every single thing that exists, Torah included. That's why Bikurim have a special connection to Rosh Hashanah, not just because Bikurim are first and Rosh Hashanah is first, but because Bikurim represent the essence of the Neshama, and that's what Rosh Hashanah is all about. Because the unique way that we serve Hashem during Rosh Hashanah is with absolute Kabbalah soul, accepting Hashem's authority as it emanates from the essence of our Neshama. In various places in Hasidus it explains that generally speaking Kabbalah soul is the just do it attitude without involving the sophistication of, of emotion or the sophistication of the intellect. Whereas the Kabbalah's oil of Rosh Hashanah goes beyond emotion and intellect and keys into the essence of the Nisham. That's real Bikurim. The, the, the essence of our soul that kind of puts Hashem first before anything else and it's intrinsic and it's inherent to us. And by the way, that plays out also in another element of Rosh Hashanah's theme, which is the time that Hashem chose us to be His people. One of the key themes of Rosh Hashanah is that the concept that Hashem chose us as His people is more apparent. 
The fact that Hashem chose us, like we say in the davening Rosh Hashanah just before we blow the shofar, we say Hashem choose us as your inheritance. Why does Hashem choose us? What makes Hashem choose us? What makes Hashem choose us is the essence of our soul. In other words, He doesn't choose us because of certain things that we've done or talents that we have. The Habirka's explanation is Real, genuine, authentic choice is a choice that someone makes without any logical basis. To put it differently, that means that when Hashem chooses us, it has nothing to do with anything we have done, achieved, or have in our talent toolkit. Why? Because Hashem is choosing us from a perspective where none of that is even relevant. It's far deeper than anything we could achieve, far deeper than anything we could do. We're talking at a level where technically Yaakov, Esav, Jew, non-Jew doesn't even appear to be different. In fact, when you're at the very, very lofty spiritual levels, they actually may align better with Esav than with Yaakov. Like, for example, Yitzchak wanted to give the highest brachas to who? To Esav Davka. The idea of Hashem choosing us is, it doesn't matter what makes sense. It doesn't matter how the whole higher spiritual hierarchy aligns. What matters is, I love Yaakov. Hashem chooses us because our neshama at its core intersects with Hashem's essence. What we in this context are calling the Bikurim dimension of the Neshama. From that perspective, Yaakov is for sure the ultimate, the firstborn, the Bikurim. And Hashem Dafka chooses us. That's the theme of, of Rosh Hashanah. So Rosh Hashanah is the Bikurim time of the year where we experience and our Neshama is exposed, and therefore Hashem's essence clicks with our essence, and he says, I can only choose you. you. With this, we can also understand one Rashi back, where Rashi comments on the words where the Torah says, Today Hashem instructs you to do these mitzvahs. Says Rashi, what does it mean, today? Every single day, Torah should be absolutely fresh, as if you were instructed at Mount Sinai today to fulfill Torah. This idea that every single day my experience of Judaism should be 100% new and fresh, what does that mean? It means, What it means is, Hashem tells us this, that every single day your Torah should be fresh in the context of Bikurim, so that we know whichever area of Torah we might be engaged with or learning about. Totally unrelated to Bikurim. That part of Torah also has to be absolutely fresh. No, we don't say because the reference to saying that Torah should be brand new every single day was mentioned by Bikurim, it only refers to Bikurim. No, it refers to the whole of Judaism. Every single law and statute of Torah. Where Rashi explains that those words, Chukim and Mishpatim, in this particular context are talking about Bikurim. So now you're going to ask yourself the question. Why did Hashem design it in such a way that every single day I have to see Torah and mitzvahs as brand new? And what's my anchor for that? Bikurim. So why do I always have to have the flavor of Bikurim in all of the mitzvahs that I do and all the Torah that I learn? And especially in a way that it always feels brand new. And not like Khadoshim Bekhof Adim and Kivish Hebi Rosh Rashim Makim Machab and Gel Tari Mitzvah. And we say Khadoshim, literally it should be new, not like Rashi says elsewhere. Ke Khadoshim as if it were new. What's the what's the correlation? Why is Bikurim such a pivotal 
concept that has to influence the whole of Torah. Well, based on what we said, al pi it all makes sense. Vapial nam muvan. Bechol anyonim sheisek v'ma adam. Whatever element of Judaism a person engages with, kelal ba'avoid ashayeches dekeiches pratim, including elements of Judaism that relate to very specific skills. Part of Judaism relates to understanding Torah. Part of Judaism relates to loving my fellow Jew, etc. No matter what I'm doing, no matter which element and aspect of Judaism it is, Rashi is alluding over here to the fact that every single mitzvah I do should be with a sense of the absolute dedication that the essence of my soul has to Hashem. Like, for example, when we speak about the Kabbalah soul, the acceptance of Hashem's authority that is supposed to take place in Rosh Hashanah, which, as we've already discussed, where do you get the, the capacity to have such an incredible dedication to Hashem and Rosh Hashanah? You get it from the Bikurim dimension of your soul that's already there. So what do we want? We don't want Rosh Hashanah to be a spectacular day on the calendar and then it's over. We want that intensity of commitment to Hashem to spill into the rest of the world. And so it should be every day. Every single thing that we do for Torah Mitzvahs, every single day should be be, have this palpable feeling with the full energy and the full excitement of freshness as the mitzvah of Bikurim. In other words, the message over here is that the dedication, that the essence of my neshama automatically has for Hashem and automatically is a big part, as we shall see in a moment, that should be what I feel every single day. Going back to the Or HaTorah on this week's parasha, the Tzemach Tzedek quotes the Medrash Tanchuma that says, We're always familiar with the concept that Tfilah represents or, or replaces Karbonois, but there the Tanchuma says that davening is specifically linked to Bikurim. Why? Because the goal of davening is to link the conscious part of my with the deepest part of my that I'm usually not conscious of, the essence of my That's why you're supposed to daven before you learn Torah to get you into the right place. The way to be able to learn Torah properly. How does a person reach the point that you can learn Torah properly? By awakening the essence of your neshama. And how do you awaken the essence of your neshama? Through davening. So it's the same theme. To activate this absolute commitment to Hashem throughout the day, every day, all the time that I'm committed to Torah and mitzvahs. One more point about Rashi's explanation that becomes clear based on Chassidus. Because Rashi says it's brocha shetoichna haftocha. He says it's not just a brocha next year, please God, you'll be here. It's tishne, you will be back here next year. It's a guarantee. Now usually if something is to be guaranteed, it must be something that humans don't influence. Because if we could make a choice about it, then it's not guaranteed. Now that's strange. Surely the whole purpose of Torah Mitzvah is that we are to make choices. And anything and everything is controlled by Hashem except for our choices vis-a-vis -vis our fear of God. In other words, our commitment to Torah Mitzvah. How can you give a guarantee that we'll be back next year? Well, how, how can this heavenly voice be absolutely certain? You will obviously do what you have to do, and therefore you'll be back here next year. That seems to undermine the entire principle of free choice. Unless, of course, you learn Chassidus. Based on what we've explained, that Bikurim reflect the essence of my soul, which is my truth. So I really am. Then it's move on, then it's understood. Because the Torah here is describing a brocha that relates to my essence of my neshama waking up and propelling me forward. Not only is that not something that contradicts my ability for choice, 
and Adarabe, in fact, to the country. Any time that I choose to do a mitzvah, why do I choose it? Why do I choose life? Because of the essence, the, the essence of Manya Shomer. So it's kind of guaranteed that that's going to happen, at least at some point. It's even understood on a pshat level. We already said, what is the purpose of Bikurim? Gratitude to Hashem. Rashi said, why does a person bring Bikurim to show I'm not ungrateful? So if Rashi is correct and he identifies that you're not an ungrateful person, well then it's pretty clear. Obviously you're going to bring Bikurim. So it's guaranteed. So there's a beautiful harmony between the guarantee of Hashem on the one hand. Why is it a guarantee? Not because of any miracles, because of the reality of who we are. Now Bikurim at the end of the day do not get burnt on the Mizbech, they get enjoyed by Koyhanim, which tells us this magnificent insight. That however advanced, high, holy, pristine the essence of your neshama is represented by Bikurim, it's not just going to float off into some spiritual abstract realm. It's going to have a take-home, a real take-home for us. We already mentioned earlier, it's not good enough just to have the fact that your essence of your neshama is capable of this total dedication to Hashem. It's got to spill out into real life, into the daily experiences and the various facets of who you are. And you'll see that represented in the story of Bikurim. What is Bikurim? Bikurim is not a, a, a pill pill, it's not a meditation. Physical fruit that you bring. And which fruits? The best of the best. That's why the Mishnah Bikurim tells us you may not bring Bikurim from the dates that grow on the mountains because they're inferior. You have to bring the best of the best for Bikurim. And we don't then take these Bikurim and then dump them on the Mizbeach to burn. They're eaten by the Kehanim. And they're eaten in a way that is represented with joy, joy shared with the whole family. Meaning to say, that indicates to us that we want to take the Bikurim, which represents the essence of the Neshama, and translate it into a physical human experience of eating. Something that becomes part of your fleshy self. Something that you celebrate. And seeing as the theme of this entire section of Torah is that Hashem rewards us measure for measure. Therefore Hashem's bracha is because you did this. You brought Bikurim. You brought your dedication from the essence of your soul and you translated it into something you feel and enjoy and celebrate in your life. I promise you you'll do it again next year. Hashem promises him he's going to have beautiful fruits again next year because you need beautiful fruits for Bikurim. You'll have the fulfillment of the Pasuk right over here that says that you will rejoice of all the tremendous goodness that you have for you and your family. The exact same thing applies to our avoid as Hashem during Rosh Hashanah. If over the course of Rosh Hashanah we are able to awaken that very deep connection to Hashem that comes from the essence of our Neshama, what do we get for it? Hashem inscribes us and seals us for a good year that is sweet, both in a spiritual and in a physical sense. To you and your family, in every single area that we need, the three major channels being children, health, and, and uh, livelihood, and all of them in a generous way. Please, God.